Hello, everyone. Welcome to week eight, Decode Silicon Valley Start of Success. This week, the topic will be the art of scale, no growth equals death. Um, here's our agenda. As usual, we will start with 15 to 20 minutes topic overview. Then we will have a, around an hour speaker's keynote session, including the Q&A session with Marcel. And then lastly, we'll have 30 minutes for logistics and then discussion section. All right, so um, today we're gonna be talking about um, scaling. So right now, um, based on this graphic, we're gonna be looking at the stage in between stage two and stage three. As you can see, um, we have just um, ideally achieved product market fit, and now our company, our quote unquote company is ready to uh, be scaled. Um, and you just must make sure that um, when you guys are working with your guys' Um, startup ideas that you have achieved product market fit before you guys start scaling. Otherwise, you'll be scaling the wrong product for the wrong people. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with Facebook's uh, growth story. Um, so as a quick exercise, can I have everyone type in the chat um, the answer to the following question? Um, but before that, I'm going to give you some context to what we're looking at here. So this is Facebook's growth story. Um, this is on the x-axis is the year, and then the y-axis is the amount of users um, that Facebook had. So the solid line shows um, the, their actual growth, and the dotted line shows um, the predicted growth. And as you can see, there's these three, um, three bo uh, white boxes that are covering text. Um, and at these points uh, is where their um, actual growth exceeded their predicted growth. So in the chat box, can I just see uh, some answers to what you guys thought the first instance of them achieving higher growth in actuality over predicted um, was? Like what development in uh, Facebook? Okay, so I'm seeing some people saying um, IPOs, okay, open to public. Um, any other ideas? Allowing friend requests, interesting. Expansion, okay, yeah. Those are some pretty good answers. Um, so the actual um, answer was translation. So I'll elaborate a little bit on this. Um, at this point in time, in 2007, 2008, Facebook had already had a decent um, amount of users throughout the US and other uh, majority English speaking countries. Um, so in order to further expand their user base, they translated their um, product, or in this case, their interface to other languages to increase access to more geographic markets. Um, and unfortunately, I forgot to um, include the transition, but yeah, right under the white box, it should say translation. Um, moving on to the second point, um, right here under 2011, do you guys have ideas for what development in Facebook's history could have caused that uh, spike in growth? Okay, um, I'll I'll just tell you guys. So, uh, yeah, I cell phone. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, thanks. Was um, okay, so yeah, the second thing they did was um, going mobile. Um, Facebook's interface at that time was strictly desktop and. Um, as at that time, um, smartphones were kind of getting uh, some more traction. They were becoming more powerful and smart. And so when they were able to shift to the mobile interface, um, they were able to shift focus and growth uh, kind of exploded there. And then for the third instance, um, any guesses? Okay, I'm seeing some responses now to the previous question. What about the third and final development? WhatsApp, these are great. Great guesses. Okay. IPO again. Okay, in this case, um, it was uh, just expanding on the internet. Um, so the dot org. Uh, basically, the, if you think of it, at this point, there are over a billion users 
and that's a lot of people. So what they did is they worked with different carriers in order to get more people access to the internet. Um, so they would go into countries that had less people uh, with access to the internet and they would get them onto internet and consequently they were able to open Facebook accounts for them. Um, so that was a pretty sneaky um, strategy by Facebook to get more users. All right, so uh, moving on, um, depending on your, uh, the guys, your guys' businesses that you're working on, um, whether it be in this class or in real life, um, you'll always have different ways to scale your product. So let's say your product is a real estate um, related product where people will only need to use it maybe like three or four times in their life, depending on how many times they um, move. Um, and when they do it, what they're gonna do is they're gonna search on Google, they're gonna search real estate services. And so your best bet in that case for your company would be to optimize your search SEO because uh, we want to do is you want your company to be the first one to show up to improve the chances that they use your service. Um, there's also referrals. Um, referral programs are always very helpful. So um, an extreme case of this is PayPal. They started off um, by offering people $20 to sign up and then another $20 if they referred a friend to sign up. And then um, this worked for a while and then they changed it down to a $10 reward and then a $5 reward. And at the end of this referral campaign, PayPal actually spent um, in between 60 to $7 million uh, dollars doing this. But um, again, this was a great um, way for them to scale their business. Um, also in terms of virality, um, if network effects improve user experience for products, then getting more users using your product in the first place should probably be a high priority. So what this means is uh, services like LinkedIn and Facebook wouldn't be all that helpful if only 10 users were using it. Um, that's the point of the, um, the business is to allow people to interact with other people. So if there's not a lot of people, then that kind of defeats the whole purpose. Um, another, another example to look at this is say uh, Tinder only had a um, population of users in uh, Florida. If I were a user in the Bay Area, then that wouldn't help me at all. Um, so, um, so then that's, uh, that's relates to how users, having more users improve the overall experience. Um, and then another case is that if, uh, if you already know who your customer is going to be, you should probably start making the sales call right there and then. Um, take, for example, aerospace. There, it's probably not going to work for a um, aerospace to start selling um, products to Berkeley students. Um, so instead, they should be calling Boeing or any other big relevant companies uh, to sell their product to them. All right. So, uh, so you guys may or may not have seen this conversion funnel stage um, diagram, but it applies basically to uh, virtually every single product. Um, and for in the case of Yelp and Wikipedia, their acquisition uh, loop looks kind of like this, and you guys can take a look. But, um, you know, people, they kind of find stuff, uh, they find stuff online and uh, a percentage of them use the services of Yelp and Wikipedia. And another percentage of them actually create content on Wikipedia or Yelp per se. And then um, Google will pick that up and then more people will search for it um, and then, you know, move, uh, they can move forward that way. And then another acquisition loop uh, in terms of paid marketing relates to some companies like Blue Apron, Casper and Uber. Um, and the steps include new people, they kind of see ads and they click on it. And then a percentage of those people who clicked on the ads will then sign up to try the product. And then another uh, percentage will sign up within that to actually pay for the um, paid features of that product. And then using that revenue that's generated, they're able to buy more ads and then the loop continues. So with the same paid marketing loop, um, this one's a little just more broken down. It's more um, in detail. And the idea here is that once you break down the loop, you can make different growth decisions. Um, based on the data. So, so here's this more detailed version of the previous loop. Um, there's a lot of ways to scale um, once you break down the loop. So uh, one example that comes to mind is how you can uh, send gifts to friends on SnackPass, or you can get discounts by ordering with them. Um, these both 
are able to increase traffic um, on their application and serve as a growth tactic. So here's just a quote by uh, Edward Tuft. It's uh, from the Netflix documentary, um, The Social Dilemma. It's uh, there are only two industries that refer to their customers as users, um, illegal drugs and software. And this is, uh, this is a little bit dark, but I think it's very interesting in the fact that because we as in humans are the product in this case, our data is being sold to advertisers who can uh, then more specifically sell uniquely targeted products back to us. Um, so that's just a little tangent, uh, interesting note. And then finally, just looking at the human side of um, all of these uh, ways to scale, it's also important to scale the management and the people behind the scenes while we work. So I've talked a lot about products um, in the past couple of slides and marketing strategies and tactics, but always remember that people uh, as CEOs, as founders need to scale up as well themselves. Um, in Ben Horowitz's book, um, Hard Things About Hard Things, he mentions that managing people is a skill uh, learned through experience. So the more you do it, the, uh, the better you'll be, uh, be able to be at it. And uh, you should give other team members um, and yourself the opportunity to make mistakes in order to learn and grow from them. But you also need to realize the people that um, that are good at managing a team of 10 may or may not um, have the abilities and skills to manage a team at per se 200 or 2000 even. Um, and so with that, I would like to pass it off um, to Serena to introduce Marcel, who's our guest speaker for the day. Yes, so welcome Marcel. Um, I want to introduce you first. So Marcel Santilli is a CMO with a proven track record of growing growth, building high performance teams and evaluating brands through content, community and experiences for both large enterprise such as IBM and HPE and hyper growth startups such as Scale AI, HashiCorp, Service Titan and Opkeep. Marcel is also an investor and advisor for a variety of early stage startups such as Metadata, Firefly, and Project Mark. Currently, Marcel is leading all of the marketing at Scale AI, which is a $7.3 billion late stage startup with the ambitious mission to accelerate the development of AI. And welcome, Marcel. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for having me. All right, let me pull up my slide. I have a few slides to share today. Um, since I'm a marketer, I guess I have to do slides, you know, so. Uh, all right, give me a second here. All right, so um, I'm in full screen mode. So if there's questions, please feel free to jump in and um, interrupt me or ask questions. Uh, I'd love to make this um, interactive and trying to make this as constructive and helpful as possible to all of you. So anyways, just a little bit about me. Um, I always like to start a little bit about me personally because um, you want to understand the person behind the work a little bit, right? So I was actually born and raised in Brazil, moved to the US when I was 11, didn't speak a word of English then, um, grew up in Texas, been in the Bay Area the last seven years, married, and uh, I got a mini golden doodle there named Zoe. So uh, if you hear barking in the background, that's who it is. Um, and yeah, I actually live in Oakland Hills, so not too far from, from Berkeley. So thank you for, for having me. So at a high level, before I jump in into some of the lessons I've learned along the way and in, in growth and working at all of these different startups and large enterprises, just want to share a little bit of my, my journey and some of the, the things either um, I built or uh, the teams that we work together uh, build, you know, so um, early, early on in my career, I started at very large enterprises, so it's a little bit unconventional compared to folks here in the Bay Area where they, they might go straight into starting their own company or um, go into work for a startup, right? But um, I wanted to share some of the growth stories um, because from, from my perspective, I tend to learn a lot from just hearing stories versus just keeping things in abstract, right? Um, I heard earlier mentioning like SEO and things like that. And that's really kind of how I got my start uh, was really this idea that, hey, why pay all this money and ask to try to rent somebody's attention when you can really earn their attention and, and really earn their trust, right? 
And so a lot of what I've done early in my career was build these massive content programs that um, essentially help big brands like IBM become a publisher, right? Like this is an example of a site called secretintelligence.com where we started from nothing, launched the site, grew it out very quickly, and it became the biggest source of pipeline and revenue for uh, that business unit, right? Uh, and then at HP, we kind of did the same thing, but we wanted to build some network effects into it. So we built this kind of contributor network where, you know, the more contributors we're getting, the more articles we're publishing, the more articles we're publishing, the more visitors we get, the more organic traffic, which made it easier to get more contributors and so on. And so uh, both of those are still around and um, really, really proud of building both of those completely organically, right? Like no pay ads or anything, you know? Um, and then, um, there we go. Um, then I was at HashiCorp for, for a little bit. And uh, for those that don't know HashiCorp, they're now Series E, probably, um, you know, a little over 10 billion valuation. And, and so I, when I joined, we were slightly less than 100 employees. And we went from um, one to build a team from one to 26 people. But most importantly, we um, more than 18x ARR in that period of time. Um, HashiCorp is a really interesting story too. I won't go dive too much into details, but Long story short, they built six open source projects. So it was very much um, building from the ground up and bottoms up motion as well. You know, so they're a great story of um, building network effects and open source. Um, that was a uh, changing industries a little bit. Uh, was a service titan today. They're a Series G company, a, a little over eight billion valuation, uh, and you can see they're kind of the chart and organic traffic too. So that's kind of like a theme for me as. Uh, always trying to think through like building content, building trust with those you're trying to serve. And I'll go into that a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Then finally, a peep, um, again, kind of similar things uh, around like doubling ARR, uh, but an earlier stage company. And you can see the chart on the top left. Um, and, and then finally, I've been at scale since the beginning of the year. So um, by the way, we're hiring a ton. So I have to say that too. Uh, <laughs> so if you're ever interested, uh, so we're a Series E company in the AI space, and our mission is to accelerate and democratize uh, AI. Um, so accelerating the development of AI, and we work with these amazing tech forward uh, companies to uh, to do that, you know. And so uh, it's been really exciting. We've done some really awesome things this year. And a few weeks back, we did this awesome conference called Transform X and uh, learned a ton from the process, right? So if any of you ever have any questions, we have... Um, a ton of different things I've done in terms of playbook, right? And, um, and now enough about me and let's jump into uh, thinking about scale, right? And the art of, of scale. And to start, I think the, the biggest thing I want to say is um, there is no single path, right? Like the, if, if I learn anything is that don't go into any situation, whether it's your own company or you're working for somebody else, uh, regardless of the industry, and think you know the playbook, and that's the playbook that's going to work, right? Um, if, if I learn anything, is that you're going to have to adapt and things are going to be different, right? So there's not one single path. You can look at, you know, a hundred successful companies, and I bet you they all done things differently. Even if they said they did the same thing, they've all probably arrived at that differently, right? And so my goal here is not to share... Uh, rules of what to do and not to do, but rather uh, talk about some lessons I've learned along the way and maybe help you avoid some mistakes, <laughs> if, especially at the beginning. And then I always try to think about things in terms of principles and frameworks, right? And mental models and trying to share some of the mental models and frameworks and principles that have worked for me um, in the past, you know? And, but I'll tell you, I'm uh, still learning. So, um, like I said, it's whatever your plan is, it's definitely not going to be that way. <laughs> I can guarantee you that there's going to be a lot of things you don't expect, right? It doesn't mean you shouldn't have a plan and you shouldn't plan for it, right? But there's a lot of things that come up. And so um, I want you all to, to really take away three words as you're thinking about skills, you're thinking about growth uh, that I wish somebody had told me in you know, my very first job, right? Uh, that's repeatability, scalability, and, and sustainability. And, uh, and I'll get a little bit more into what those things mean. And, and I'm glad um, there's this chart that you all shared at the beginning, right? But um, 
you know, there, there's these different phases in, in a startup that a startup goes, goes through, right? Um, I'm definitely not going to talk about product market fit. You all have already covered that. Uh, but how I like to think about it is really kind of um, a few different phases. Uh, you have your problem solution fit, which is you're trying to find a problem that you can solve in a market and, uh, and potentially make money, right? Then you have your product market fit, which you all probably cover and talked about it. Um, and then there is the go-to-market fit. And, uh, and this is the really here you see the middle of this graph, right? The, the four to eight, where you're trying to find a repeatable motion, uh, proving you can sell to, you know, other people can sell your product other than the, the, the founders. You want to make it scalable and, you know, and, and all of that. And then you get into this other phase where it's about truly, truly scaling and reinforcing things and then eventually planting new seeds, right? Uh, today, I'm going to focus mostly on the go-to-market fit all the way to starting to scale, but I'll go last into, you know, going from, you know, 10 people, 50 people to 500 people, or what does it take to get to 5,000 people, the things that take into scaling an organization, hiring at that level, and things like that. So I want to focus more on really the kind of like the core growth in those critical early stages, right? Um, so this is just a different way to think about this, right? Like, what are the things that you want to focus in in uh, the different stages? So um, moving on here, one thing that um, I want to share with you is just a few different pillars, right, of um, how I think about growth and trying to simplify things a little bit for you, right? But I think that a mistake that companies and founders usually make early stage is that they there's a reason they're starting a company there's a reason like you're passionate about something enough to go dedicate years if not decades uh -huh. of your life and you know uh spend your um you know all the effort to go build right you have to feel passionately about something right and so oftentimes early stages uh, founders are gonna be, have this really strong conviction for whatever reason, for good or bad, right? Um, but the, the first thing that is really important is to be intellectually curious and really seek to understand. And what I mean by this is everything you're doing has to be guided by the, the market, the people that you're trying to serve, right? And, and you need to understand that it's gonna be an ever evolving process of understanding who your customers are what is their journey? And things are going to change along the way. Your understanding of your customers are going to change. The market you're serving might change, right? And you have to be open to that, right? And so the first step here is who should should we serve? Um, oftentimes that, that's thought of like as a almost like a given, right? You, you might say, okay, well, we're going to go after this market because we think this is the market we should start. And it might be based on some bias you have, right? You might have some interactions with your friends or with family or uh, people you're close to, and, and you might have some interactions. Those interactions or your first, you know, what you've experienced yourself might shape your reality. And, and so you might say, hey, this is, who, this is who we should go after, and this is the reality, right? But this is where you need to be really thoughtful about um, putting some data behind it, talking to your customers, talking to prospects to really back up who should you serve? What is the market that you're really there for, right? Um, talk to people, interview them. And this is a mistake a lot of people make. Um, I've been in companies where they're late stage or they're later stage and they're doing actually not bad and they're growing, right? And you tell them like, how often do you actually talk to customers and prospects? And, and oftentimes they say, well, I don't have time. I'm too busy building things for them, right? Uh, but how do you know you're building the right thing? And even if you choose to ignore their feedback, right, it's important to, to have their feedback and build processes in which you're going to build these feedback loops and, and try and understand, right? And it starts with qualitative and it follows by quantitative as well, right? And so um, as you think about who should you serve, right, a bigger question is what is the market that you're going to be in? What, what is the market that you're going after, Right. Um, I think there's a lot of tons of great examples. If you think about Airbnb, um, probably the founders, when they started, they didn't think that their market was literally everybody, right? Uh, Uber is the same thing. Who is their market, right? They didn't think that was literally everybody. Um, and so oftentimes your understanding of your total addressable market is going to change as well, right? Uh, but, but you're going to have to make some decisions early on. Hey, am I going after a smaller chunk of a bigger market and I'm going to try to be a leader there? and just dominate that smaller chunk? 
Or am I going after this massive market and finding uh, a unique way into this market, right? Um, but oftentimes, there's two concepts that are not talked about as often, right? That are just as important, which is your SAM and SOM, right? One is serviceable, addressable market, which is um, what is the part of the market that realistically you can actually serve with the product you have today or the product that you're building right now, right? Um, you can say, well, we're great. We're going to be great for everyone. Cool. That's your uh, total addressable market. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you actually have a product that can serve in their, their pain points and what the need is for those people, right? So there's a smaller chunk of that, that market. Then there is like, what is the serviceable but obtainable piece of that market? In other words, the people that you can actually realistically, realistically get in front of, right? So if you think about Facebook, right, uh, the, to the earlier example, um, until they actually got internet to <laughs> certain places of the world, those people were actually weren't part of their total addressable market or th they were part of their total addressable market, but they weren't part of their serviceable uh, obtainable market because they just didn't have a, a mobile phone and, and access to, to internet, right? Um, and so that's something very important to, to think through um, as you pick a market, which is a very critical point. If you pick the wrong market, even if you have a great solution, there might not be a need for it or there might, there's no way for you to make money, right? Um, then as you're going through this process, you need to be crystal clear. And if you're ever in the process of raising money, it's going to be crystal clear if, if you know this or you don't know this, right? You need to understand what are the needs and pain points. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up, I know it probably doesn't feel like, well, this is nothing to do with scale. The, the, the reason I, I bring these things up is because I've been in so many instances in companies where they don't understand this foundation and, and then they're just spraying and praying, right? They're just going after whatever, they're throwing money at things, they're spending money in ads, they're hiring people and, and things just sometimes get stuck and don't work the way they should, right? And they don't know why but it's because they didn't build a good foundation and understanding like, hey, what is your secret sauce? Like, what is, what, a, what is the thing that you can do better than anyone else, right? And is there truly a need for this, right? Are they really ready and willing and able to buy from you and use your product, right? Um, and the best way to really know this is, is to just talk to people, right? Um, there's great books like out there like, uh, the sprint where I talk about like getting feedback and doing quick iterations, right? This doesn't need to be a science project. Uh, when I was upkeep, um, we did a two and a half month long project where, where we had only two people that were fairly junior and getting early in their career. And we interviewed 250 customers and prospects. And we just offered them $50 gift cards. And we got so much insight out of that and it completely changed our product roadmap and our messaging and our personas and the people we're going after, right? Uh, so that's a critical point. To that, um, there's this framework and, um, I, I'm, you know, some of you might already heard or maybe it's covering other classes, but this concept of uh, ideal customer profile, ICP, you know, um, is that's gonna be a terminology or a term that's used pretty often if you, if you wanna start your own company and raise money right? And, and ultimately, it's kind of this process of having confidence, right? Okay, I know what market I'm going after, right? And now, like, what is my ideal customer profile? And, and I won't spend too much time here, but these are concepts that you should be thinking about, right? Do they have a problem that needs to be solved, uh, or there's an opportunity to take advantage of, right? Is that problem, um, you know, something that there's some sense of urgency around it, or it's just something like, eh, whatever, right? Um, and then are they ready to solve that problem, you know? And then do they have actually the budget, the means and the authority uh, to solve that problem, right? So those three things, ready, willing, and able are super core and foundational, right? If you can't prove that, you might have a great hypothesis. You might have a great product. You might be going after, you know, a good market, but they're actually, you might fall flat and just not be able to grow no matter how much money you raise, no matter how much money you spend and no matter how big the market is, right? Um, you might be trying to be everything to everyone. Uh, and then there's these other things that are kind of compounding effects, right? They're just gonna help make your success even better or even easier, right? Which is, hey, can you actually serve these customers and be successful? Or after they buy from you, they're gonna be frustrated, right? Can you actually get in front of those customers and acquire them uh, in a cost-effective way, right? Like what's your customer acquisition cost hack? 
right? Um, and is your CAC less than your lifetime value of, of that customer, right? And then are these customers that you're going to sell to, and then eventually they're going to buy more and spend more money with you, right? And do you have the potential of kind of this word of mouth, right? Uh, and other people telling them, um, telling others about the, the product so that you grow more organically, right? Okay, so going through this, who should we serve? What's the needs and, and the pain points you're trying to solve? And then is understanding the context, the journey, right? Like, how do you find them? How do you attract them? How do you get them to engage with you, right? Um, and here, context is everything. It, is, it includes everything from getting the right timing, the channels you want to be in, the, the, the format, how, your message, your delivery, right? And, and so it's thinking through the context. You can say, hey, I'm going to build this platform for developers, uh, but that's pretty broad, right? Well, there's developers that work for startups. There's developers that work for old school, like super traditional enterprises. There's developers that work for a 10,000 company and have massive teams. There's developers that work for super scrappy companies. Well, guess what? That context changes what that person needs and, and their journey, right? So you got to think about their context and, and, um, and the timing and all of that, right? And then as you, as you think through this, it's telling a compelling story, right? Again, I, I mentioned this before. If you have the understanding of the needs and pain points you're trying to solve, right? Now it's talking about what is your value proposition, right? How can you deliver? And then how can you deliver a story that's just simple and compelling, right? Uh, people buy into the, the stories. They're not going to buy into something complex they can't understand and grasp, right? And then finally, uh, once you go through that and, and here in the next step, I'll go through kind of more concrete examples and frameworks and things that are more, more actionable, but these are just principles to hopefully take away before you go into growth and optimizing, you, you can't optimize something that's not working, right? Uh, you can make something that's working better, but you can't, <laughs> you, can't, you can't optimize your way to growth, right? You gotta get it right first. Um, and this is gonna help you get it right. So how do you help the people you sold to or that are starting to sign up and adopt your product, right? How do you get them to realize value of your products as quickly as possible? Right. And there's a lot of times when, you know, I've advised companies and startups where, hey, we're getting a ton of signups and people are talking about it and then just drop off and there's no usage. Right. Which means your product's not sticky. There's something off there. And so uh, part of growth, part of marketing, part of doing all of this is realizing value, you know, and helping your customers realize value. And if not, understanding what do you got to fix to remove friction for how they do business with you. Right. And then finally, are there things you can do to facilitate word of mouth and sharing and referrals, right? Uh, there's companies like um, Gusto, which is like an HR platform. They do like a, a referral. So when you log into your account, right? Um, I use a, a service called Freshly, right? Every time I invite someone or Peloton, right? Like every time I invite someone, I get a credit, right? There's things like that that you can do, but what are the things you can do to build a growth flywheel? Um, and, and I have some slides later on to talk about that because it's something that's super critical for you to think through early stage, right? Um, okay, so now you understand. Now you have a good foundation. You have a good story. You know who you're going after. You know the market you're playing in. You know the unique pain point and needs in that market and what you're going to solve. So now everything you're going to do is going to be uh, better, right? Now, one thing I'll say, and I, again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this today, but... Now you need to build a team and culture eventually, right? Reason I'm not spending a lot of time on this is because there's plenty written on this. And, um, but just know that there is literally nothing more important than people in any business you do, period. End of sentence, right? And, and I think that's something that a lot of founders, a lot of even successful founders don't come to appreciate until much later on. And you can't be successful without a great team, without people, and without building an amazing culture that can, uh, you know, live up to certain values that uh, allow you to be successful, you know? So, all right. Now, building an operating model. Um, again, I know this is pretty high level right now, and then I'll get into more details and I'll be, feel a little bit meatier here, but um, repeatable, scalable, sustainable. At the end of the day, right, it's okay to do certain things that don't scale early on, right? And that's good advice. But what I've seen is companies that try to just apply that to infinity and just continue to just do things that don't scale 
and do things ad hoc and not build momentum, right? Um, how I like to think about it is, is kind of if in order for you to master anything, in order for you to be good at anything, you need to have a method by which you're going to master that, right? Um, and you need repetition, you need momentum, you need practice, you need to just keep doing it, right? Um, and so that's kind of this operational cadence that you need to build and think about, right? And figure out what's your operating model. Like, do you have control of the levers in your business that are going to allow you to grow and scale, right? And, and so that's kind of the, the foundation. And, and how I like to think about this is really kind of two vectors. One is effective, the other one is efficient, right? So a lot of people will go into and think about growth and only focus on efficient. And that's why I focus on so many things at the beginning of this, uh, because you being effective, heading in the right direction is just as important as you being efficient, right? You can optimize the hell out of going super fast in the wrong direction. And that's actually worse than going slow in the right direction, right? Uh, because there's a lot of rework, a lot of pivots and things like that, right? And so, cool. All right. So now getting into a bit more of a framework as you think about scaling and you, you think about all right, how do I apply this? I know um, there's this kind of funnel that was shared earlier. So this is probably not new to anyone. There's nothing here that's unique uh, by any means, right? But um, whatever you want your funnel to be, like figure it out and you've got to measure, right? Um, and, and it starts with understanding like what is your buyer journey, your customer journey, your user journey, whatever you want to call it, right? And how can you remove the friction from, from that process, right? Uh, but then understanding that there's your acquisition side and there's your uh, like realizing value at the bottom. And so it's your onboarding, whether it's self-serve or not. And then there's the growing usage, growing your customers and, and get and expanding, right? Um, and, and that side sometimes can be even more powerful. There's amazing companies out there that have gone done very well after going public like ServiceNow, where they're classic like land and expand, right? where every year it gets easier. Because if you think about it, if you're at a million dollars in, in, in revenue in ARR this year, and you have a net retention rate of about 150%, that means if you do nothing next year, you're gonna be at 1.5. So if you want a two X, you only need to make up, you know, 500,000 there, right? And so things become easier and easier over time if you, if you can retain and expand your customers effectively, right? Uh, however, a lot of people want to just pour more gasoline at the top and, you know, get more awareness and get more eyeballs and do all these things. And then they have a really leaky bucket, right? Um, and their customers are churning, they're unhappy, and they're not telling others about it. So then they're constantly replacing their entire customer base all the time. And it just becomes a very expensive and unsustainable model, right? Um, and so um, this is where is critical and you'd be amazed at how many companies that are successful that don't actually measure this on it and look at this on a daily basis right um and this is not hard to do at all like it but you have to do it so as you think about scale and growth um i like to think about uh four different concepts of what are you trying to optimize for right um and and so if we just start in the acquisition funnel for now, uh, really, usually when you're trying to grow, you're trying to solve it. I was actually, I had coffee with the uh, CEO founder yesterday. He just raised 10 million not long ago. And he's like, hey, you know, nothing's working. I'm pouring money into marketing. We have no leads. Like people click, but nobody converts. What the hell is going on, right? And some of the questions I asked him were around, okay, what problem do you think you have? Do you have a volume problem? There's just not enough people coming through. Do you have a conversion problem? In other words, like, are, is there a lot of friction and people are just getting stuck? Or do you have kind of a velocity inertia problem where people are not making decisions, they're not buying, they're, you know, or they're not buying fast enough, right? Or do you just have a cost problem where it's just too ex expensive? It's more expensive to acquire a customer than, than the money um, you can make from that, right? Um, and, and kind of thinking this through and operationalizing this funnel and optimizing for this funnel, once you understand who you're for and who you're serving, uh, really the, the best advice here that I have is just having this really tight alignment between marketing, sales, customer success, and, and product, right? Um, I've been in companies in the past where 
you know, marketing generate leads, throw it over the fence to sales. Sales says, okay, these are really crappy leads. Thank you very much. We're just going to do our own thing. They missed the number. Uh, they then end up, you know, signing really bad customers. Customer success is frustrated. Uh, those customers churn. And then the, you know, sales says customer success didn't do their job. The customers churn. Company doesn't do well. And then the product team, and then everybody blames the product team because the product's not good, right? Like literally that's normal. <laughs> so you want to avoid, you don't want to be that, right? And the, and the way you do that is by setting goals and, and making sure there's this tight alignment where everybody feels invested in the same goals and um, heading towards the, the same direction, right? Okay, so this one is a bit of a, an eye chart here. And um, in order to, you're, you're ultimately, if you boil down everything you're trying to do when it comes to, to growing, you're trying to do two things, right? You're trying to grow revenue and increase product adoption. Ideally both, there's times when people do one and then the other comes later, right? Or vice versa, right? But ideally you're doing both in parallel and, that, and that's the, the critical piece. And so there's this um, kind of framework, it's not perfect. And, you know, I try to update this a little bit this week, but um, there's kind of like these tiers of things you're eventually gonna need to think through, right? Uh, but at the very top and, and why I talked about a lot of things I did at the beginning is that um, ultimately everything has to be guided by your company strategy and your product. Like what, what, what the hell do you actually do? What's your strategy? Do you have a vision? Like what's your business model? How are you gonna make money? What's your, um, you know, what market are, are you in, right? Um, and so um, th then you have kind of your, your go-to-market and, and strategy and your distribution, right? Are you going to be like, what's your sales motion? Are you going to be mostly outbound? Are you going to, you know, be more of a product-led growth motion? How are you going to support and serve your customers, right? If something goes wrong, um, what's the value prop? What's the competitive landscape look like? Um, then you have kind of the story that you want to tell, right? About what the hell you, your company actually does and your product does and how does it solve something unique? and why should they care? Um, but then there's also this other side that a lot of people don't think through, which is building content, right? And content can be a lot of different things, but ultimately it's your job to help your customers be better at their job and, and answer the questions that they have and be the best answer to their questions. Because by doing that, essentially content marketing, um, you're gonna build trust with them and then eventually they wanna do business with you, right? Um, there's also things around like product education. Do people actually know how to use your product, right? Enablement, right? There's things around like, you know, if you have a sales force, how are you going to help, like teach them how to sell your products and, and talk about it, right? Then you have kind of like your experiences and that's how people interact with your brand, right? It can be your website. It can be directly in your product. It can be events. Um, you know, if there's a mobile app, it can be through your social, uh, social channels. It can be through a support channel, email, right? Whatever it is, those are the experiences. And that's how your customers and your consumers are going to uh, experience your, your brand. They're going to interact with your brand. And that's how they're going to build a perception of your brand, right? Uh, for better or, or worse. And then there's channels. Oftentimes people kind of confuse experiences and, and other things with channels. And they think about what's your go-to-market strategy. And they immediately think channels, right? Well, I'm just going to put a bunch of ads on Facebook or, or LinkedIn, right? And, and so I want you to think about channels kind of differently. Channels is, uh, in my opinion, where people are and you're trying to meet them where they are and hopefully earn their attention um, or kind of rent their attention, if you will, right, with ads and, and paid media. And so that, that's one way to think about it is, hey, those channels are places where people are spending time already or, you know, that's where they're coming through and you're trying to route them towards you, right? Um, and then ultimately there's this kind of this layer of, the data, the technology, and the insights you need in order to understand what's working, what's not working, and, and it help uh, these kind of workflows and operations run smoothly, right? So what's your process from the time somebody clicks on an ad or visits your website to the time they fill out an ad to the time they book time with sales or sign up for your product to, you know, every step of the way, right? Uh, to the time they swipe a credit card, uh, and, and things like that, right? And, um, and making sure you're thinking through that versus just doing it and, and hoping for the best, right? Cool. And um, I know I'm going fast here and this is a lot of information. Uh, hopefully this is, um, this is helpful, but um, it, another way to kind of think through this is to kind of simplify things a little bit is 
this concept uh, of, of a flywheel, right? And, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but this is actually a, a way that I help kind of simplify how to think about things um, in my, my current team as well. But at the very top, you, might, you have your product and your go-to-market strategy, right? Which we talked a bunch about, right? And then um, at the bottom, you have people, processes, systems, and data, right? Again, you can't do anything if you don't have people to do the work uh, and great people by that. You know, you need to have processes by which things happen, right? You can't just do it. Um, I mean, you can, but that's not sustainable. Um, you need to have systems, right? Like people need to do business with you. You need to put the customer data somewhere. You need to, you know, keep track of deals. There, there's all these things you got to do. So those are systems. And then there's the data, right? And then eventually making sense of all of that. So that's kind of the foundation, right? Um, and, and ultimately what you're trying to do is attract, you know, people that have never heard of you, you know, turning them into interested and engaging with you and eventually getting them to become customers and delighting them, getting them super excited, uh, getting a lot of value from, from what you're doing and then turning them into promoters so that they share about, um, you know, a ton and get other customers for free, right? So again, we talked about volume, conversion, velocity, and cost. So those are the vectors that the knobs that you're trying to optimize for. And at the end of the day, you want this, this flywheel to get bigger, snowball effect, right? You want it to, to gain momentum and just grow as quickly as possible, right? And then um, on the left side, you have kind of like your tiers and you know, your story, like what do you actually do, your content, the experiences you build, you know, uh, if there's an ecosystem play or a community play, right? Like if you're open source, there's an open source play, a community. If, you know, there's other communities out there that you want to tap into, right? And then the channels. So that's one way to hopefully kind of simplify this, this growth flywheel, right? And um, the reason this is important is because it's going to give you clarity on what to focus on. Uh, if you understand if your business can have uh, a flywheel or, or not, you know, and so um, I, I was actually advising a company recently and, um, you know, I, I understood what the company was doing, but they were really struggling to, to raise money, actually. And um, I, after a little bit, I said, okay you all need to summarize what you're trying to do because they were talking about, oh, well, we can be this and we can be that. And then, you know, we have this right now, but we're going to build this and this and this and that. And they're like literally three people, right? And I said, okay, you get in front of any investor and you say those things, then they're definitely not going to write you a check. That's why you're struggling is because people don't understand what do you want to be. You can be anything you want to be, but you got to pick something. You can't be everything, uh, at least not right away, Right. And so we did this, essentially this workshop where we worked through like, okay, let's build your flywheel. And so, um, again, the, the Amazon example has probably been way overused. Everybody refers to this example, right? But it's, you know, pretty simple, which is, hey, they, um, the more selection Amazon has, the better the, the customer experience, which then uh, drives more traffic to the product description pages and the overall site. Uh, which then attracts more sellers because there's a ton of demand that they want to tap into. Uh, the more sellers, that means they bring more product to the table. And the more that loop exists, there's an economy of scales. And so they can build better and, um, and more cost-effective infrastructures, whether it's delivery and, and supply chain or everything else, right? And the better their infrastructure and economies of scales, that means they can deliver things faster and they can lower the cost. If they lower the cost, they can pass some of that, that savings to customers and fast delivery and lower cost all uh, ensure there's an even better customer experience which then reinforces that other loop. And there's a few other growth loops here too, right? Flywheels here. But this is like the, the, the kind of the classic one for, for, for Amazon, right? Um, if you think about most successful business today, Shopify, um, Spotify, you know, uh, LinkedIn, and like many of them have network effects built into them. Many of them have some kind of growth loop and reinforcement, right? Whether it's sharing or there's something that just reinforces that business and builds uh, defensibility, right? Um, now, if you were starting Amazon today and you didn't think like this at all, right? It probably wouldn't have been obvious that the number one thing you should have been doing is growing selection, right? Um, it, you might just say, you know, what I need to do is just spend a bunch of money on ads and grow, right? Um, so, so, so it's not obvious, but if you, if you have that focus, 
um, we at scale, one of our advisors is Jeff Wilkie. You know, uh, he was the uh, CEO of consumer business at, at Amazon. You know, he's he's spoken to our leadership team. He actually spoke at our conference a few weeks back. You know, uh, Brad it, uh, was at Amazon for over 10 years as the uh, VP of robotics for the whole company. So we have a few Amazonians at, at scale. And, you know, um, if they weren't intentional about these things, I think, uh, the outcome could have been different and they wouldn't have uh, grown in the size they, they have, right? And so I think there's a lot to learn from that, you know. Um, on the left side here, uh, I don't want to spend too much more time, but there's this, a lot of different ways to, to build uh, a flywheel. There's ways to build a flywheel into your product, into marketing, into what you do in sales, uh, even into how you serve your customers and support, right? Um, and so the important thing is you don't have to get it perfect. But if you're intentional about it early on, it might change how you optimize your product roadmap, how you build the product you're building. And in the case that I was mentioning with the company I was advising, it actually went from them really struggling to raise money to, um, you know, raising a little bit more than they needed uh, in a few weeks, right? And this happened actually pretty recently. So, um, so as you think about uh, a growth flywheel, there is um, a lot of really great articles out there and I encourage you all to search and read and you know filter through the, the junk but there's some good stuff out there but there's this one concept that I think is kind of interesting and just to illustrate the power of focusing on the, the right things at the beginning right um, and so there's this, this concept of a, a K factor if you will right where it's kind of the your ability to get referrals and word of mouth times your ability to convert um, to people to customers um, and then, um, and then the concept of the R here is retention, right? Like your ability to retain those customers over time, right? Uh, or year over year. So, um, you can see the Delta between, you know, if you have no referrals and you have a fairly decent conversion rate and, um, a okay, uh, retention all the way to if people refer if you have, you know, a 1.1 K factor and a retention, gross retention of 95%, it's this kind of steeper curve, uh, exponential curve, right? So um, it, it might seem trivial, but this can be the difference between, um, you know, being flat, not raising any more money and, you know, not working to being one of the success stories, being a unicorn, raising money or, you know, just being successful and achieving what you want to achieve. So that's why all that to say that it's just as important what you say no to, uh, if not more important than what you say yes to, right? Um, it, if you become a founder or you go work for early stage startup or even like a mid to late stage startup, um, you're, you're full of energy, you're excited, you're, you're passionate, you're trying to do something, uh, but oftentimes companies fail to scale not because they're not doing enough, but because they're doing too much. And um, I think that's, um, you know, something to keep in mind. Don't try to do too much. Do a few things really, really well and get really good at those things and then do other things, right? And so, and, and then kind of to, um, to achieve that growth, you, and why saying no to things is it's, it's about focus, right? Um, and if you don't have focus and you're constantly chasing the next shiny thing and you're full of ideas, right? Um, one way I like to drive this home with my teams is if you get 10 things to 99%, right? Um, you technically have delivered zero value to your customers. If you get one thing to 100% and you made zero progress on the other nine, you've actually delivered something. And then you can work on the second thing. And while you're working on the second thing, you're getting feedback on the first thing you did to make sure what you did is actually right or wrong or the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. But then by the time you're getting on the second or third thing, your fourth thing might be completely different than if you worked on all 10 things in parallel, right? So thinking about, there's actually this really great a book called The Black Box Thinking uh, that talks a lot about like feedback loops and things like that, you know, but the focus, right? Uh, is really, really um, important. And, and at the end of the day, you really can't improve what you're not paying attention to, what you're not focusing on, and you're not measuring. And, um, you know, it's easy for startups to get 
um, you know, distracted with vanity metrics, right? Um, but at the end of the day, if you have focus, then you can set goals for, for everyone that's working on what you're working on. And it can be kind of like a battle cry to grow, right? And, and that has really powerful results. And, um, and then something, there's this book that I highly recommend. Um, I'm a student of companies that have been great uh, and done something right, whether it's Amazon or others. You know, there's this book recently called Working Backwards. Um, a lot of great lessons here to, to think through and, and learn from, you know. But one thing is uh, focus on the input metrics, the controllable input metric that will drive the right outputs you're trying to drive. So if growth is your right output or revenue or product adoption or sign ups, right? That's, you want to focus on what are the inputs that eventually drive that. You just focusing on revenue actually won't move those numbers. Uh, you just looking at revenue harder and going, what can we do to change it, right? Like you want to focus on kind of the, the input metrics, the things that you can actually control on the day-to-day, -day, the things that you can change, right? Hey, can I improve the product description that I have on this page? Can I create better content? Can I, you know, the traffic that's generated from doing that? And then all those things eventually will lead to adoption. But then you need to figure out, and, and I can't tell you that answer, like you need to figure that out, but you need to figure out what is the thing that's gonna drive the output you want um, that, that you can focus on today, right? And then we're almost wrapping up here and hopefully this has been somewhat useful. Um, and, and so the fourth thing here is building defensibility, right? So you understood what you're for, what you're doing. You've hopefully built a team, a culture, and at the very least built a good, decent operating model that can scale. And you know how to optimize your business. You're measuring the right inputs. You're looking at the outputs, but you're measuring the right outputs to to continue to move those numbers in the right direction, right? You've done all those things. And now like one thing that's super core is just thinking through building the fensibility, right? We talked about growth flywheel. So um, in kind of similar to this, right? Early on in a company's uh, stage, you're, you're really trying to just do something unique or solve a new pain point or something, right? And so oftentimes you're focusing on just speed and building uh, a decent value proposition and building a differentiator from what's already out there in the market, right? Um, but there's a, a lot of really good material on um, what builds defensibility. And, and the way I like to think about when it comes to um, defensibility is, is really, um, I'm sorry here, I don't know what happened. There it is. Um, is that if, the deepest pocket company in the world, an Amazon or you know a trillion dollar company, decided to go after the market that you're in. Um, <laughs> can you survive? <laughs> Will you actually survive? And your level of defensibility depends on that, right? If Apple tries to build a music service to compete with you, and you're Spotify, does Spotify survive and continue to do well, right? If every single media company on the planet try to be the next Netflix, to Netflix survive and continue to do well, right? Um, so so that that's ultimately the level of defensibility that you have as a business, right? And um, NFX is, has great resources, uh, nfx.com, and uh, I, I love their stuff and their, their, their frameworks and how they think about it, right? So on the left side, you have things that are kind of your competitive differentiators that you're trying to build early on, whether it's like, founder relationships you're building through that and content the fact that you're if you're in silicon valley or access to to talent creating bus patents you know unique team speed and upping the tempo or just getting a ton of money and then figuring out right those things are important but they create a certain level of, of value right and really if you can build a sensibility that value becomes exponential especially especially network effects right so I won't do a lesson on network effects. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier today, but um, I am obsessed with network effects. And I, I recommend, you know, if you ever want to start a company or you're serious about it, go read every single thing there is to read about network effects and go become a master of that. Um, you know, but, um, but there's a, a few other things that are super important, right? Like if you think about brand, um, any brand that's a, a verb, right? To Google something, right? I'm gonna Uber somewhere, right? Like those things become a verb. That means they have a powerful brand that becomes synonymous with a lot. Skill, like can anyone do logistics better than Amazon? Impossible, right? 
can anyone do search better than Google? <laughs> no, because it has more data and economies of scale, right? Uh, and they can do those things a lot cheaper than anyone else. And it's a barrier to entry. And then embedded, especially when you're selling to businesses, how can I make it to where whatever I'm selling is so sticky that will be so hard to rip out because it's so embedded in the way this company does business now that it would be very difficult. So it's like Oracle back in the day, you know, Oracle databases, right? It's uh, Workday might be a good example of that. HR systems, people don't want to touch it. And it's just like, yeah, it's going to be too hard to replace. Salesforce is super embedded, right? Uh, so those are all great examples, but, but yeah. Cool. And uh, again, like I said, a different resource here, but thinking through like, what you're going to start to notice once you start to read up on this stuff and, and think through it is that um, every successful company you see out there has some of these principles. They've done some of these things well, and whether they actually thought through this and that's, and they intentionally did this or they stumble upon it or not, most of them didn't stumble upon it. Um, there is a reason they're as successful as they are today. Right. And it's not because there is this, you know, single person that made this one decision that made them successful. It's, it's never one decision, one thing, one person, right? It's, it's really just being intentional about what you want to build, you know? Um, and, um, and yeah. And so, um, to wrap up, that's the art and the science of, uh, scaling in a repeatable, a scalable and, um, sustainable way, you know? Um, and I'll just, and on a few words of um, advice from all the mistakes I've made in my life and career, uh, which is, you know, just have intellectual curiosity, um, be ambitious and just work your butt off. You know, um, I think for me, I, um, as an immigrant, someone that came in, I remember just thinking to myself, I've just got to work harder than everyone around me and uh, things will fall in the right place, you know, and, and, they, and they have, and, um, you know, and, and there's like this awesome feeling or just gratifying feeling of just working really hard, having great work ethic, but then just being kind to people and, and just trying to learn. Um, that comes from that intellectual curiosity. And um, yeah, you, you'll figure things out, you know. Uh, I didn't grow up in Silicon Valley. I didn't know any of these things were possible, you know. So even, you know, I went to University of Texas, didn't think that like, I, I, like, I wish I knew, like, there's all these possibilities of things you can do, like, you know, uh, I know now, but, but you're, you're, uh, you should feel very fortunate and blessed and you should, you know, um, always continue to earn your spot, right? Like, don't take anything for granted. And, um, uh, and then, you know, like I said, just, just be kind. Um, it goes a long way. So, uh, anyways, that's, um, uh, that's it. Like I said, skills hiring, check us out. And, um, I hope this was, Someone helpful to to all of you. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or ask me ask me questions. Great, uh, thank you so much, Marcel, for that really insightful presentation. We really appreciate you coming here and talking to us about you know your experiences and all the things you've learned yeah, uh, exactly. along the journey. And yeah, I think we do actually have um, a couple of questions uh, from both students and some facilitator created questions. So I guess we can dive into that for a little bit until eight o'clock. I'll try to go through as many as I can um, for that. But yeah, so the first question that we have is, obviously you have a very interesting background um, and I think it'd be really great for the students to hear sort of how you started um, with your story and how all of that led to marketing at Scale AI. Yeah, um, so, I think a lot of it started when I was um, in in high school. Actually, I took a class on web design, and um, and then I learned how to use Photoshop, and that just sparked my curiosity on the creative side. And um, and then um, I started to design stuff, and and some people saw it and said, "Oh, that's really cool! How much do you charge to do that?" And I started to do that for people in high school and restaurants and local businesses and and bars and you know you name it. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's kind of how I paid my way through college. I started my own little creative agency. Um, but, but so like going through those motions, like I wasn't expecting to like get rich or make a ton of money, but I think that most of the things that helped me early in my career and, and what helped me get to where I am today was the, those early things that I learned on my own, you know? Um, and so I think that sparked a curiosity of like, I can learn a lot better 
by focusing on the things I actually care about and that I'm passionate about and that actually help me do something I'm trying to do right now. Everybody learns differently, so I learned that way, right? But that started to kind of open door after door after door, you know, um, and then um, I, um, like I said, I started at large enterprises and, um, but I was always trying to build something. I, I'm a builder. I love building stuff. I love a challenge. I love, you know, proving people wrong, right? I kind of have this chip on my shoulders kind of thing. And so, um, it, but then after a while, I started just saying, I just need to get out of my shell and just talk to other people and share what I've done because I think the people can learn from it. So I started to do that. And I was actually, uh, I got invited to speak at a conference in Palo Alto. Uh, so I came out and then somebody from the audience saw me. I was like, exactly what you build that idea. I'd love for you to build it at HP, you know? And so then one thing led to another and then being out here in the Bay area and, you know, networking and, and then kind of one thing snowballs. And then at some point, um, you know, I got recruited to go work for, for HashiCorp, which was like just a lucky thing, right? Because, um, I have, was trying to break into startups, but startups are really biased towards hiring people that only have worked at startups. And so I think I'm an example of, you know, you shouldn't be biased. Um, you should question your own bias, uh, rules don't always apply, you know? And so, um, so yeah. And then for, at HashiCorp was there for a few years and we just worked really hard and then at the end of that, I was kind of ready to try different things and was just continue to grow and got introduced to some VCs and, you know, um, and then uh, one of them introduced me to um, Alex Wang, who's our CEO and founder. He really hit it off, but timing was off, but we stayed in touch. And then uh, earlier this year in January, we, we kind of made it work. And so very, very fortunate. So that's kind of been my my journey, you know, it's definitely never intentional to, to be at a startup from the beginning, you know, so uh, just working my, my butt off to get here. That's really cool. And it's a really inspiring story. I'm glad that everything worked out for you. Um, so yeah, the second question that we have is, uh, why is Scale AI so special? And uh, what are you currently working on there right now? Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, so, you know, every company is different. Every company, there's things that are great, things that they need to be better at, you know. Um, I think what I, what I try to look for in companies um, is, first of all, like the space, the market that they're in is really important. And, and the reason it's so important is because it's about like, what's the size of the opportunity that if everything goes according to plan, <laughs> what's the size of the opportunity, right? And and so being at HashiCorp and being in the cloud space and seeing like how important it was to be in a company that, you know, the market itself is growing at 70% a year. And so it, it ends up being, you just have to execute really well. AI, I truly believe for the next 20 to 50 years, you know, it's going to be the, the biggest opportunity generator in the planet and is, is where the, the future is going. And it's going to add so much value and help improve people's lives and um, do all these amazing positive things. There's dangers as well, but it's like, I think it's mostly going to be positive, you know, and so, so that is really, really exciting. And, and Alex has this kind of built this mission and this vision around how do we accelerate that improvement in the world that's going to happen and democratizing AI and helping like all these companies develop AI capabilities, right? Which is really, um, really exciting because oftentimes like you go work at a company and they are only serving one market, one space. And we get to work with like everyone from like the, the coolest autonomous vehicles all the way to like government and national defense to, you know, everything in the middle from e-commerce to like tech forward companies to more logistic players. And, and so you get to see all of them. And we also get to sell to, um, to AI vendors. They're also doing those same things, right? Like, so, so it's, it's really cool. You get to experience a lot and then, um, one thing that really was inspiring when I first met Alex and we hit it off is just like, he's uh, very approachable and humble, but also super ambitious with a strong vision. But then like, he's the kind of person. And then you look at the track record that is like, okay, this person is just going to figure it out. I don't care what it takes. They, they're, they're not just ambitious, but they can back it up with execution. Right. Um, and so those things kind of in the company and the people and the culture fit well with like how I approach things and how I get things done, you know? We have some some uh, 
company culture uh, values like up the temple, run through walls, right? Earn customer love. And so like this all like really resonated with me, you know, so, so yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Glad you found that match. Um, it looks like we have a question from uh, one of our students in the audience. Uh, Anton, you can go ahead and unmute and ask what you want. Thank you, Amir. Uh, hey. First of all, th thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time. I, I assure you, we all do appreciate <laughs> your being here in, in person or virtually. Uh, I have two questions. One is concerning uh, something you've uh, uh, mentioned. I have a lot of friends who uh, have been working on startups and startups. Some of them have already crossed to the VC side. So I'm familiar with the paradigm. Uh, of you know not getting stuck under some sort of elephant's foot uh, about to slam onto you. But what if you are already are there? Do you run and hide and find some sort of a different direction you know, uh, up? Or uh, are there some, some ways to defend turf that um, still keep you kind of in, in their crosshairs, but always maybe a step ahead of them, maybe more agile? Like what would you do with uh, with a situation like that. And second, um, in terms of, uh, I've worked a little bit for, for, for a startup that was fairly small, and I'm curious to see how it's actually done, not the janky sort of ad hoc ways that we figured out how to do it, but I'd like to actually learn from, from the pros. So who would you say are the pros? Like if you are particularly interested in growing a business, and you were graduating, say, next semester, where would you go? Maybe in the Valley or, or maybe somewhere else? Uh, like, wh where would be that, that place to, to grow professionally to see how the big boys do it and uh, learn from, from someone, from strong mentors? Yeah, yeah. Um, th thanks, thanks for that. I, um, so just to make sure I understand your first question. So, so what do you mean with the elephant? It's, it's kind of a bigger, stronger competitor that has more resources than you, and you're kind of stuck in this position where okay, what do we do? Do we just run? Do we just start something completely new? Do we just double down? It, is, is that a fair uh, understanding of your question? Totally, yeah. Awesome, awesome, cool. Um, I, I wish I had a better answer in saying this is what you should do, but I can tell you like um, some, some ways to kind of maybe think through, right? Um, at, at the end of the day, you got to do something that's better, different, um, or you, you got to improve. And sometimes like if you're, if your answer to why you think you're better than what this competitor is or what this competitor could be is, you know, we have slightly better design or our brand's kind of cooler or we can ship something in one week and they can ship it in a week and a half, um, you know, that, that's probably not going to be enough, right? Um, I think a great example of that is like, what's it called, tiled, right? Like the little uh, RFID things <laughs> and then Apple like releases that, like, I felt really bad. Like <laughs> I had gotten so many of those before at conferences and never actually used it, you know. Uh, but if you're in a situation like that, I'm like, can you pivot? I don't know, maybe, right? Um, if, if you can find, like that, that's why in the presentation early on, like I talked so much about like talking to customers, right? And getting their feedback and, and people are willing to talk to you for free, right? And sometimes like, they might not tell you exactly what they want and how they want it, but there's going to be an insight that comes and maybe there's an insight that can come that can help you pivot. But, you know, um, in some cases, right? Like I think I give the example Spotify. I don't know if that's the greatest example uh, or Netflix, right? Um, it, it's, it's really come down to how strong, like how sticky is your product? How, you know, committed are your customers? And, and if you, if you can acquire customers more efficiently than, than that big giant, sometimes you can get away with, with being like the more, the more nimble one, right? Um, and, and I think if you can build an ecosystem at, at HashiCorp, we had six open source projects and one of them Terraform's about like kind of deploying uh, and automating a lot of cloud infrastructure, right? And if you think about it, like AWS has their own version of Terraform. Uh, Microsoft Azure has their own version of Terraform. Like, so, so if you think about those things, like those companies are trillion dollar companies that could literally like, could have like, done whatever right but there were our platinum sponsors at our conference because we were driving workloads to them right so they are invested in not killing them right um and and then there was like benefits in that but then also the open source nature of that enabled it to build like kind of an ecosystem that was stronger than any one company could build right um and so i think those things are all um 
all important, you know, so, uh, so yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's helpful or not, but, um, and then to your second question, like, um, where to go, like, as far as like the types of companies and, you know, um, I don't think there's one specific, but, but I'll tell you, um, kind of principles and things to look for, right. That you can optimize for. Um, and, and I think there is, um, if you want to, if you're intellectually curious and you don't know what you want to do down the road, right. Depending on your end goal, right. Let's say your end goal is to start a company later, but you want to learn by joining a startup or joining a company now and, and go from there. Right. Um, I actually gave this advice recently. It's like, go to a company where you're going to be able to be exposed to a lot of things and you're going to be empowered and you're going to be able to just drive things and own things. And then, but then you're also going to have the flexibility to be able to, to move and try different things uh, over the period of time, you know, where you're going to feel like a little bit of a mini owner of something, you know, and I think that that applies. And so I think you can really get a sense of that during the interview process. Um, and then the only other thing too, is go to companies that their founders are very principle oriented. So like if during the interview process, they don't talk about principles and things that they think about, like go read the Amazon leadership principles or, or the culture page from Netflix, right? Like those are companies, those are the classic examples. There's plenty of companies that have that, but where they're intentional about building their culture and their processes. And, and then, you know, you might not like all of them, but then you're going to be able to learn from a lot of them. So those are the two things I would potentially look for if I was, you know, you know, trying to find my, a, a job early in my career right now, you know, and, and obviously potential, right? You want to make money too. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that, Marcel. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so I guess the third one I'll ask is, uh, what were some of the challenges of starting and scaling multiple publications? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the, the biggest challenge is operations, honestly. So uh, when we started Tech Beacon, you know, um, there's no website, there's no brand, there's no names, there's zero traffic, and we had not a ton of budget. So we hire a few managing editors. I'm actually talking to one uh, today, catching up with him. But um, and early on, we started saying, okay, now we got to create content, create the site, started publishing. Um, but we quickly realized we were, you know, spending money and time publishing a 3,000 word article, and then it would just fall flat, right? And so we built this whole process around. A pitch process where we're trying to understand essentially like is there a need for this like go search for something and go look at the top 10 answers that come up are those answers good and if you were to you know how can you improve on those answers are there things that those 10 things don't do well that you can do differently you know and try to optimize for humans right um so so that was a key insight and then as we started to um scale that we were doing about 20 articles a week so the first year we published about 1.6 million words and and it just becomes a pipeline problem that you're trying to solve, right? Where um, if you're trying to publish 20 articles a week uh, and it takes two to three weeks to publish an article, that means you need to hand out, like, you know, have 60 assignments out in progress, which also means you need to be approving about 25 new ideas every week. And so the, the sheer volume becomes a very hard game to, to, to operationalize. And so it's figuring out, like, what are the each steps of the editorial process? And now can you outsource some of those and, and figure out like where can you add the most value and, and be really uh, thoughtful about trying not to create rework and, and things like that, you know? So that was, I think the hardest part. The rest was actually easier because, you know, organic traffic started to pump, uh, you know, get higher. There's things that you can do for promotion and getting the word out and, you know, but if you can get the editorial process and you can get quality content out on a regular basis, the rest will come. Perfect. Um, and for the purposes of time, I'll go ahead and ask the last question real quickly. Um, sure. So what advice do you have for adjusting to a new company's culture? Yeah. Um, I think this one is a, is a hard one because uh, during the interview process, you're not going to be able to really, really know what it's going to be like. Um, but one thing I can tell you is companies are a reflection and a 10x amplification of the founders and the CEO. So any character flaws, any like fears and securities will get reflected in, into the culture unless they're intentional about like, you know, building a culture towards a certain way. And so 
Um, but, but when it comes to kind of adapting is just don't come in thinking you, you have the answers, right? Like just be, be curious, be, be pragmatic, but also be open to being wrong and seek to understand first. And as you seek to understand, go as deep as you can. Um, I remember when I first joined service site in the first month, I literally went and did onboarding with customers on site. I did like training. I, you know, talk to over a hundred um, customers and prospects and employees and just ask them questions, ask them, you know, what was working, what was not working, you know, try to build relationships. And, and then like, when you do want to start changing things and doing things, right, you're, you're, you understand and you build some level of trust with people, right. And, uh, and then um, things will kind of fall into place. And then you can be intentional about what you want to do and accomplish. And, you know, and, and then just, work really hard and and i think the the thing that's really important and i wish i had valued that even more early on in my career was just be a pleasure to work with uh you'd be amazed at like oftentimes people want to be the squeaky wheel and try to change everything and think they know all, all the answers but just being a pleasure to work with where people actually want to be around you um <laughs> actually makes it a lot easier to adapt to cultures and eventually change it if needed and and do well you know Okay, I think we can wrap it up because it's already eight o'clock. Um, we want to thank you, Marcel, for your time and then your presentation to share your knowledge and experience with our community. And then we're really, we're really greatly honored to have you for our class. Yeah, my, my, uh, my pleasure. Um, I hope it was uh, useful to everyone. And like I said, if uh, you have questions, feel free to um, connect with me on LinkedIn and, um, and ping me and if I can be your help. I'm always happy to get back. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Mm -hmm. And then let's move to logistics. So we have another assignment that is due next Thursday before class. This is the interview assignment three, which is really similar and almost the same to the previous interview assignment that you guys did before. Um, but this time we really encourage you to um, talk or discuss with your team after you finish these interview assignments to gather all the feedbacks that you get so you guys can be ready and then to develop the final projects for the demo day. And then more details will be available on B course.